everybody. Thank you for joining us for the launch of the Quest for Character, which I also have in my background here. Um, what the story of Socrates and Alcibiades teaches us about our search for good leaders. Uh, so Massimo and I will have uh, a conversation for about uh, 40, 45 minutes or so, and then we'll open up to questions to the audience. So please message me. Um, you should be able to message me directly and I will uh, work through as many questions as we can in the time that we have, but we will be wrapping up around 7 p.m. So to begin with, I'm Sky, Sky Cleary, and uh, we're here to celebrate Massimo's book. Um, Massimo has a PhD in evolutionary biology and a PhD in philosophy. Uh, he's currently the K.D. Irani Professor of Philosophy at the City College of New York, and his research interests include the philosophy of science, the nature of pseudoscience, and practical philosophies like Stoicism and New Skepticism. He's published in so many places, like where haven't you published Massimo, but <laughs> places <laughs> like the New York Times, Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, um, Massimo is also a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and a fellow of the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry and a contributing editor to Skeptical Inquirer. He writes on practical and general philosophy at Medium. So if you're not signed up for his blog, make sure you sign up. At last count, Massimo has published 178 technical papers in science and philosophy. And this is his 16th book. Amazing. <laughs> um, the Quest for Character. Um, so Professor Pucci is someone I admire very much and he has inspired me and my writing in deeply, deeply profound ways. And I know he's inspired many others too and will continue to do so with this excellent book. So first of all, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, thanks for the nice introduction too. <laughs> and how does it feel to have written 16 books? And you, you're still going, right? This is oh, yeah. more in the pipeline. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. There's a couple of more proposals in the in the pipeline at the moment. I don't know. I mean, you don't, you know, you just start doing it and then you don't count really, uh, except that now they're they're listed on my webpage. So it's easy, it's easy to count. But other than that, of course, that does, to be fair, include some edited books, like the one that we co-edited together uh, with and uh, as long as and together also with uh, Dan Kaufman, uh, How to Live a Good Life. It also includes a number of technical uh, books, you know, the, the kinds of things that academics do. So in terms of books, I actually did not count it in terms of books for the general public, but this, this may be just, a I don't know, six or seven or something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, amazing. Feels weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay. So tell tell us about this particular book. How did it come about? It came about because I've always been fascinated by by the character of Alcibiades. The, in fact, the original idea of the book was to write a book about Alcibiades and Socrates uh, exclusively. And then then from there things got expanded and and I think that was a good idea to expand them. But nevertheless, the original Im impetus was Alcibiades because he was an incredible character. Uh, and I am I am seriously, I've said this before, I'm seriously puzzled that nobody's ever done a movie about Alcibiades' life yet, because it's possible that it's going to come out soon. So this guy was everything you would want in a man. He was impossibly handsome, super rich, very smart, very brave. The only problem is he suffered from hubris and and um, narcissism to a degree that few others probably have, have equaled in in the history of humanity. And so he was this complex character who could do all sorts of incredible things, including leading Athens multiple times during the Peloponnesian War and, and including scoring incredible victories against the uh, very, very high odds. But at the same time, he constantly undermined his own success uh, because of his uh, his hubris. And um, he was also a student and friend of Socrates. 
And so the big the, the the book starts out in the second chapter in the book really is about this relationship between Socrates and Alcibiades, and it starts out with a dialogue between the two, which is based on a on the Alcibiades Meyer, which is attributed to Plato, where you really see the dynamics. So it's this is a young Alcibiades going to Socrates and saying, look, I'm going to be introduced to the Athenian assembly, you know, tomorrow, and I really want to do things right. Uh, I want to lead our country. I want to do all sorts of things. And, and I need your help. I need your, your advice. So he's at least conscious enough that he needs advice from, from the great philosopher. But then they start talking, and basically Al Socrates very quickly shows to Alcibiades that this guy has no business being in public in public service. <laughs> he is so so not uh, does not have the right character, the right attitude toward things. That um, Socrates says, you know, my my friend, you you really are suffering from a particular peculiar type of stupidity. He says um, a the kind of thing that actually is very common among politicians. Socrates says. You basically suffer from the word that Socrates uses is amatia, which translates fairly well to unwisdom, essentially lack of wisdom. And so it doesn't matter how rich you are. It doesn't matter how smart or how brave you are going to make, make a disaster if you actually go into politics. And Socrates turned out to be right. And Alcibiades was a disaster. Mm. How did Socrates know that? Like, what was it about, like, yes, unwisdom? What does that mean? Like, what, what was, how did he know that uh, Alcibiades was, uh, was, um, That's a you know, good not... question. Uh, it, it's like, I mean, I, one way to answer this, I guess, is that Socrates was the kind of guy, because of his experience, that uh, he could see it, you know, recognize it when he saw it, like uh, that famous, uh, American judge who said that, that you, you you can't define pornography, but you see it when you know you know when you see it. It's the same idea. That is, it's really difficult to to define exactly what constitutes wisdom. Uh, but Socrates made it his business to probe people throughout his life to see if, in fact, they were wise, if in fact they knew what they were talking about. And uh, it takes him in the dialogue. It takes him only a few exchanges with uh, Alcibiades to, to clearly conclude this, like, now that's not, you're not the right kind of person to doing this thing. In fact, in the book, I point out that Socrates does this a number of other times with other people. For instance, uh, Xenophon in, uh, in the Memorabilia, which is a book about Socrates, tells us that Socrates discouraged another important guy from going into politics. Uh, and there was Glaucon, who was Plato's brother. He was also, you know, thinking of going into into politics. And, and Socrates, in that 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 exchange is actually very funny because Socrates says, "Oh, okay, so you want to go to to into politics? So tell me, um, what what is it you think you, you think you're going to do?" And he says, "Oh, well, we're we're going to improve the city finances by you know going to war with you know nearby cities." And Socrates says, "Okay, well, that's what a lot of people do. So now." Did you look into the strength of our military and of our, you know, neighboring cities? Clark says, no, no, that's difficult. I haven't done it yet. All right. So you want to go to war, but you have no idea how strong our military is. And, and this thing go, keeps going and on and on and on. And, you know, Clark admits that he hasn't looked at the city's finances, that he doesn't know anything about uh, how the city actually works in practice. And at some point, Socrates says, you know, you really shouldn't do these kind of things. It's just like, forget it. Glaucon does surprisingly follow Socrates' advice. He doesn't get into politics and literally becomes a musician of, uh, of some renown. On the other hand, his, his son, Charmides, also uh, has an interaction with Socrates some years later. And Charmides has the opposite problem, that, that he doesn't want to get into politics, but, but Socrates thinks he should because he's, he's good and he's, you know, he's not only smart, but also... Uh, virtues, and uh, he actually manages to convince, uh, you know, Charmides to go into it. So apparently Socrates kind of saw himself as a judge of character and, and uh, saw that it, thought that it was his business to just go around and, and encouraging or discouraging people uh, from doing certain things, not just politics. In the, in the memorabilia, he even gives uh, business advice to a courtesan. So it's not, it's not just about politics, but mostly it's about politics. Okay.
<laughs> and one of the things you talk about in the book is with respect to Socrates advising Alcibiades was that you know he classifies Alcibiades as one of these people who is ignorant and doesn't know that he's ignorant, which is one of the most sort of dangerous kind of um, people out there. So, you know, what can you talk about why that's so dangerous and, and how do you deal with these kind of people? <laughs> well, uh, the second question is going to be much more difficult than the first one. How do you deal with, with these people? So let's start with the easy one. As we know, the Oracle at Delphi said that Socrates was the wisest man in Greece precisely because he knew that he didn't know, right? So being conscious of your ignorance is not a problem because if you're conscious of that, then you're not going to act on what you think is right or wrong. You say, well, I don't know. So I'm, I'm going to suspend judgment or I'm going to ask other people's advice or I'm going to try to work things out. But if you, if you know that you don't actually know, you're not a particularly dangerous kind of uh, a person. On the other hand, if you don't know that you that you lack knowledge and, and wisdom, you therefore think you do. So you think that you are, you know, a great driver and you ought to get into a Formula Uno competition. But in fact, you don't you barely know how to you know, steer a car. So that's that problematic. You can kill people as a result of that sort of attitude. Right. And it's interesting that Socrates says that it's not just uh, Alcibiades who suffers from this problem, but most politicians. Right? He makes a partial exception, Socrates does, for pa possibly Pericles, who was in fact guiding Athens at the time. Although the year, a year later after this dialogue, Pericles actually dies of, uh, of, the, um, of the plague. So Socrates seems to think that this is a general problem. And that is one of the crucial topics of the book. That is, because lack of wisdom is a general problem, especially among politicians and statesmen, what are we going to do about it? How, how are we going to address the, the issue? And there the answer, I think, is, is problematic. It's difficult, but I think it's at two, at two levels. The obvious thing to do is to teach people to be virtuous, right? But the book also shows that that's not going to work very well unless people want to be taught virtue, they, unless they actually are receptive to, and even in that case, uh, it's, there's no guarantee. And most politicians don't want to be taught virtue. They think that they know. That's because they fall into the category of people who don't know that they're, they're ignorant. So, so how do you do that? Well, there are two things I think one can do. One is invest in the next generation, focus in the next generation. Modern science tells us that character is pretty much stable by the, by the early 20s. And that's because the human brain settles down by that time. It pretty much is formed. You know, it changes, changes possible even later if, you know, if it's, it's not a you're, you're fixed and you know, set in stone. But by and large, most of your personality is going to be shaped by the time you're in your early 20s, which means that any intervention any radical intervention after that, it's going to be likely useless. So think about it in terms of an analogy. Think, so, think in terms of, let's say, learning a musical instrument or learning how to you know, speak a language. It's much easier if you do it when you're younger than later. It's not that later it's impossible, but it's more difficult, makes, takes a lot more effort. People are much more recalcitrant to do it. Um, and it doesn't come out as well. You, you're, not, you're not going to get as good at it. Um, as if you, you would have when you were young. So the first thing, therefore, would be to focus our attention not on other adults, not of people who are already into politics, but on the next generation. Right? And we don't do it. We just don't do it. We don't teach uh, critical thinking, ethics, and philosophy at the pre-college level with very few exceptions. I mean, there are, there are some cases here and there. I just saw yesterday a, a wonderful documentary uh, that was about a principal uh, in Belfast, in Ireland, Ireland, teaching philosophy to his kids. And it was like, it's incredible to see. But the thing is, they made a movie out of it because it's so unusual, right? And you have to ask yourself, why? Why is it that we don't do these kind of things? The second option is, uh, that is, what, what do you do in the meantime? I mean, we have politicians, and so we can't just 
halt everything until the next generation comes up and you know wait for another 20 years until people are people are ready so what do you do with the current politicians well there i think the suggestion again comes from modern science so uh, sociological research shows that there are two uh, professions that have a uh, unusually high number of sociopathic behavior um, in uh, among in their midst. One is politics and the other one is high finance, which probably doesn't surprise anyone, right? It's like, yeah, people on Wall Street and people in politics tend to be sociopathic. That means you just get, you need to get rid of them. You, these, these are not the kind of people you reform. You just need to replace them. And if we live in a more or less democratic country like the United States, uh, that is possible because it's ultimately up to us, right? We are the people who elect, not, not those on Wall Street, but certainly our politicians. We elect our politicians. So ultimately, the question is, why do we keep voting for people who are narcissistic and sociopathic rather than virtuous? Yeah, really good question. I would like to know the answer to that too. Um, okay, so as you said, Alcibiades didn't listen to Socrates. He went into finance. Oh, sorry, not finance. Yeah, <laughs> no, <laughs> he, was he was rich already. He was rich already. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so, and he was, I mean, you paint him as a pretty bad guy in here. You know, he caused the downfall of Athens. Um, I was shocked, like, when I read how you know, um, his wife wanted a divorce and she went to get a divorce and he like basically like kidnapped her and carried her back home. And then right. she died mysteriously, uh, you know, soon after that. So, um, you know, bad guy. But you also talk about how they had this really interesting relationship. And at one point you say that Socrates truly loves Alcibiades. And, and of course, Alcibiades tried to seduce Socrates in, right. in Plato's Symposium. But could you talk a little bit more about the, the love between them, this kind of this intense or you know relationship? Yeah, so Socrates... Uh... It, it is surprise. It is rather surprising that Socrates sticks with Alcibiades for many years. It's not just like when Alcibiades is young. Alcibiades, uh, Socrates saves Alcibiades' life in battle for one thing, and uh, at the Battle of Potidaea, he, uh, he literally saves his life. And then uh, in a later battle, also they, uh, they they find themselves fighting, you know, next to each other. And Socrates is once again the brave. And an effective one, and Alcibiades actually takes credit for for uh, what Socrates does once the battle is over. So it's kind of a weird thing. Now Socrates himself explains in the Alcibiades first, near the end of that of that uh, dialogue, he says, "Look, I love you because I see your the potential in you. Right? So I love." It's, he's talking about Eros, the, the, the same topic, of course, comes back up, as you mentioned, in the symposium, uh, where Socrates also says that he loves Alcibiades, but he loves Alcibiades not in a physical sense, the way in which, in fact, Alcibiades loves uh, Socrates, but in the sense that he sees that the potential for, for Alcibiades to actually be a good person. Nevertheless, this potential never actually gets realized. Right. And so you think at some point that Socrates was, would, would give up <laughs> on, on, on this notion. It doesn't seem to uh, to give up. At least we have no evidence that he, that he gives up. So he, he tries to be helpful to Alcibiades throughout his life and 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 he failed. So in a sense, you could you could say that is a partial failure on the part of Socrates. I say partial because in the Alcibiades first, he sees correctly that Alcibiades is not the right person to lead Athens. So in that sense, Socrates was right. But it is kind of puzzling that he just stuck with the guy for the, for the rest of his life. You could possibly uh, uh, argue that that's what a lot of teachers would do, right? That, that once you get into a relationship, a personal relationship with a pupil, especially if the pupil is in fact, brilliant in a number of respects, right? I mean, Alcibiades was was certainly impressive in a number of respects. Then you kind of keep trying because he's like, yeah, I can't believe that this guy is so smart and 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 handsome and all that, sort of, and yet I can't get through to him. Right? So I think that's at least part of the answer there for for why 
Socrates really claims that he loves Alcibiades, but it is the kind of love, it's, it, he uses the word eros, but it's eros as in live, love of beauty itself, love, love of character, not, uh, not erotic love as we understand it today. Yeah, um, and you know, going back to these sort of the Socratic dialogue, these kind of conversations that Socrates would have with Alcibiades or other people, I love the story where you talk about Socrates arguing with his son Lamprocles. Am I saying that right? Yeah. 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 And so Lamprocles is complaining about his mother Xanthippe and Socrates kind of guides his understanding towards realizing that he's being ungrateful um, right. and so you know you say how in this case um, there was a, a positive conclusion but you also say often Socratic dialogue ends in a state of aporia so an impasse where no definite conclusion has been reached uh, can you talk about why why that's the case? Why does it often come to an impasse, and and is that even a problem? Yeah, no, I don't believe it's a problem, but it's it is an interesting observation that the uh, aporia situation, that is the, the the impasse or or even confusion at the end of the dialogue, it's more typical of the Platonic dialogues than of Xenophon. If we read Xenophon side by side with Plato we really get two different views of Socrates. You can, say, you can tell that it's recognizably the same person. They're not talking about two different people, right? There's, there's a lot of overlap. There, there's even mannerisms. There, there is the way in which he addresses other people, et cetera. They're clearly talking about the same historical person. And yet we get quite a bit of, a, of differences in terms of how the dialogues, how the conversations are carried out. Probably, this is just my guess, but probably we get a better picture, a more realistic picture of Socrates from Xenophon than from Plato for two reasons. First, because Plato had his own, as we know, he had his own philosophical agenda. I mean, he often uses, especially in the middle and late dialogues, he uses uh, Socrates as his mouthpiece to, to present his own ideas. Uh, so he uses Socrates as a character, not really as the, the actual, the original, you know, the, the historical person. While Xenophon does not, he's not a philosopher. So he doesn't have a, a, a particular philosophical agenda. He has probably possibly political agendas because he was a general, but certainly not a philosophical one. And so you can tell that the, the resulting Socrates acts differently. Now in, the, in Plato, Socrates often, the, the Socratic dialogues often end up in aporia, in confusion. And there is a reason for that because Again, Socrates is famous for being the wisest person, you know, in Athens, in, in Greece, in fact, because he knows that he doesn't know. And so the, the aim of a lot of the Platonic dialogues is, in fact, to show how you get to admit other people that they don't know. You want to confuse other people because that's the first step toward wisdom. Right. If I think I know what I'm what I'm what I'm talking about, and then you show me that you I actually don't, that I'm actually not not as knowledgeable, I'm actually ignorant, then then I'm confused, right? My first reaction is like, wait a minute, I thought I I knew this stuff, and now it turns out I didn't. In the Alcibiades first, there is a nice little bit where Socrates asks a simple question to Alcibiades. He says, you know, so uh, best of men, because he addresses his, he addresses him in in a more or less sarcastic fashion. So, oh, I had best of men. How many eyes do you think you have? And, and Alcibiades like stops there. It's like, wait, I think I have two. But at this point, he's so confused. He's, he's, he so expects Socrates to pull a, another, yet another trick up, uh, out of his sleeves that he's like, well, I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't answer even that particular question, right? In Xenophon, on the other hand, occasionally you do find the aporia. Occasionally you do find that sort of the same sort of situation. But more often than not, Socrates is no shy about giving his advice. Um, and, and he's not shy about pushing a particular perspective. As I said, he positively discourages, uh, you know, Glaucon from going into, into politics. And he positively encourages his, his, his son, uh, you know, 
to to go into politics. So clearly, he has very strong opinions about. And in fact, he talks about Socrates talks in in Xenophon about all sorts of things. One of Xenophon's books is called The Economicus, where Socrates gives uh, home economics advice. He, he tells you how to run a house, a household. Yeah, that's where the word the econ economy comes from, from the economics economicus of of Xenophon. So clearly we have very different you know two different approaches now even in the platonic socrates what sometimes is referred to as plat sock for uh if, to make clear that you can't really distinguish the two even there there clearly is an agenda socrates clearly has an agenda it's just not as overt as it is in xenophon but it is an, there is an agenda like we're often told that the socratic method is about letting people think for themselves and you know, arriving at their own conclusions etc cetera, etc cetera. but but that's not what socrates actually does in plato socrates clearly asks leading questions he, he knows where he wants the other person to go and perhaps the best example of that is in the meno where socrates uh, actually shows that a slave boy who doesn't know anything is very ignorant nonetheless can come up with a geometric proof right and it's like how does that happen in fact socrates describes himself in that case as a midwife right? it's a philosophical midwife meaning that you get something out of people that are that it's already there right now this is one of the cases where plato is using socrates because the 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 end of the story is that the slave is actually re recalling this knowledge from previous lives and that that's famous plato's famous theory of recollection which goes with his idea of the immortality of the soul etc cetera, etc cetera. but nevertheless if you actually read the 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 actual dialogue you see that what's happening there is socrates is giving hints to the uh, to the slave boy and he's leading him little by little the slave boy is ignorant yes but he's not stupid he's a smart boy so he's leading him to the right answer uh the it's not an open question it's not like socrates asking open questions yeah what if, let's see what happens that's somehow sometimes the the way in which the socratic method is misinterpreted today is like oh let me ask an open question and see what can, what happens well if you do that most of what's going to happen is crap because most people don't have a lot of sophisticated opinions about specific topics such as, you know, the nature of virtue or the nature of justice. So you don't get a lot. But if you start pushing people in certain directions, knowing where you want to go, then then things get interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, lucky Socrates was a virtuous kind of person and <laughs> was pushing people in the right direction. But you talk about a lot of, you know, characters in here who were pushing people in the other direction. Um, but, you know, so the quest for character seems to be very much about virtue. And you talk about how um, we're naturally social animals. And so we have an instinctive inclination towards virtue or pro-social behavior, as you refer to it. And you know, you've also said how we can learn virtue. So can you tell us more about this, this idea of virtue? Like, what is it exactly? Yeah, that's a great question. So, and, and of course, a lot of people are not comfortable with the word virtue because either they think it's a kind of a fuzzy term that doesn't have a good definition, or uh, maybe they think about virtue from a from the point of view of, let's say, a Christian uh, tradition. So virtue as as um, you know charity and faith and purity and that sort of stuff. That's not what the Greco-Romans were talking about. The word virtue in Greek is arete which simply means excellence. And it's a general concept. It can apply to everything. For instance, the other, uh, the, the other day with my wife, we got a new bread knife and it's a arete knife. It's an excellent knife, right? It cuts really well. Now, how can you tell that that is an arete knife? Because that's what knives are supposed to do. The function of a knife is to cut, right? And so if the knife you get cuts bread very nicely, then it's an arete knife. It's an excellent knife. So then the question is, well, how do we apply this concept to human beings? Well, the Greco-Romans thought that human beings also have a function. 
It's not just lives that have a function. Uh, everything, in fact, has a function. I've, all, all objects, of course, that are created by human beings, but also all living organisms have a function. And the function of a human being is to live pro-socially and to use his intelligence in order to solve problems. Now, how do we know this? Well, the Greco-Romans thought that this was what characterizes the what distinguishes human beings from most other animals. There are other animals that are social, but none whose society is so complex and so articulately so structured as in human beings. There are other animals who are smart, but none that is as as rational, as smart, as intelligent as, as human beings. Now, in modern terms, we can say, yeah, they were pretty much right. And that's the result of evolution, right? So intelligence and, and sociality are the way in which the human species made it uh, in, in the evolutionary process, right? We don't have, uh, you know, the, the kind of, of defensive or offensive weapons that other animals have. We don't have fangs. We don't have, you know, big... Uh, muscles we don't run fast we don't fly we don't do any of that stuff what do we do is think we 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 try we we are capable of coordinating and solving problems among ourselves and solving problems by thinking so in a sense the greco romans were right that the proper function of a human being is to think and to live pro socially why because those are the things that assure our survival and then if you're if you're talking in terms of you know biological terms it's just survival and reproduction, if you're talking in social terms, is survival, reproduction, and flourishing. We do not flourish unless we use our intelligence in a social setting. We can survive, we can struggle, we can make it even in a, on a deserted island, but anyone who wants to pursue projects and wants to do things in their lives has to do that socially, right? So in that sense, therefore, a arete human being, an excellent human being, or a virtuous human being, is somebody who uses intelligence properly and who is pro-social, meaning cooperative, you know, uh, you know, helpful to others, uh, generous, et cetera, et cetera, all the kinds of pro-social behaviors that, when reciprocated by other people, lead to a stable, peaceful, and flourishing society. So in that sense, that's, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about virtue. And, and it is, therefore, not just, you know, an aspect of human life, it is the fundamental aspect of human life, because it's, it's as fundamental as it is for a bread knife to cut properly. If a bread knife were beautiful, and, you know, and, uh, and uh, a nice color, and all that sort of stuff, that doesn't matter. The question is, does it cut bread as it's supposed to? <laughs> the rest doesn't matter. So in the case of human beings, it's, it's the same idea. Yes, it's nice if you are handsome like Alcibiades or, you know, or rich like Alcibiades. Right? But the question is, the real question is, do, do you function properly? Are you virtuous? If not, then it doesn't matter that you're rich and handsome. <laughs> Right. And that, that reminds me of um, an Epictetus quote, which I just discovered in your book, which I hadn't heard before and which I love. Um, he said, most of us dread the deadening of the body and will do anything to avoid it. About the deadening of the soul, however, we don't care one iota. So is, are you saying virtue is the path to avoid the deadening of the soul? <laughs> That's right. Exactly. So yeah, Epictetus, I think is, you know, he's very blunt, he's, as usual, he's very blunt and somewhat sarcastic uh, with his students, but I think he's absolutely right. right? So, so we recognize that kind of behavior, right? There's all sorts of people that would, that are very jealous of their appearances, their body, their, and, and certainly would object to anybody else interfering with, uh, without their permission. Uh, on on any aspect of their body but then the body is actually an accessory the body is how we get through life we house is how we do things but who we really are is what's inside here it's is our decision making it's our judgment it's it's our character those are who we actually are our body as we know changes uh it ages it you know it eventually it starts breaking down and all that sort of stuff and there is not much we can do about it. Yeah, we can keep repairing it. We can try to behave in a way that minimizes the damage and prolongs uh, its existence over time. But, but really, the person, the, the, the actual person, the essence of the person, such as it is, I don't believe in essences, but such as it is, is our in our character. And in fact, 
this is not just the Greco Romans say, saying this. There is research in modern um, cognitive science that asks people, uh, you know, friends and relatives of people who suffer from different kinds of dementia, ask them, you know, how they think of the person, of their relative, of the person who is who is suffering. And there are broadly speaking two kinds of dementia. One affects memory, and the other one affects personality. Right. So there is the kind of dimension where your personality is essentially the same. You're, you're, you know, you're not behaving any differently from what you behave when how you behave before you uh, the, the disease started progressing. But your memory is affected dramatically, either the short term memory or the long term memory. And then there is another class of dementia where your memory is perfectly fine, and it is your personality that changes. So you you start behaving in a completely different way, and it's pretty. Uh, reliable finding that relatives and friends of people who suffer from the first type of dementia, the memory one, say that, yeah, of course, this is still the same person. It's still my grandmother. I can I can talk to her. And, and even though she doesn't remember who I am, or even though she doesn't remember what happened, yes, what, did, what we did yesterday, this is clearly my grandmother. But the relatives and friends of people who have dementia, the kind of dementia that affects character, are shocked because they, they say, oh my gosh, this is not the same person. This is not my grandmother anymore. It's, it's somebody else. And that is, I think, a pretty good confirmation of the uh, Greco-Roman idea, and especially Epictetus' idea, that who we really are is our character. And that is why it's so important to engage in, in the quest for character, because without it, you're nothing. You're just leaving the most important aspect of who you are to chance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, now, did you have an extra excerpt that you would like to read? Uh, yes, I do. And now, of Fabulous. course, if I had thought of actually bringing the book physically with me, that would have been nice. Uh, <laughs> fortunately, I have the um, electronic version in front of me, so okay, I can and find it. <laughs> just while you're while you're doing that, please um, put your questions in the chat because we will get to that uh, shortly. And um, in the meantime, we will back to Massimo for our reading. Oh, I found the oh, physical blurry. version. Okay. All right. <laughs> so let's see. Okay. Yeah, it's 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 unusual these days for people to actually read from their book, right? Uh, which is kind of weird because that's what a book is, something that you read. <laughs> I like it when, when authors read excerpts from their books. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. So I wanted to read a, a, a couple of short excerpts from the same chapter. This is chapter two, and this is the one that we actually talked about a little bit earlier. It's where Alcibiades uh, goes to Socrates and asks for advice. The year is 430 BCE, the place Athens, the time shortly after the beginning of the Peloponnesian War between Athens and Sparta, which 26 years later will end in Athens' defeat and a general weakening of the Greek city-states, so much so that they will soon become easy prey, first of Philip II of Macedon and then of his son Alexander the Great. But that will come later. Right now, two friends are in the midst of a momentous conversation that will mark not just their lives, but the future of the city they love. Socrates and Alcibiades, the philosopher and the future statesman in general. Socrates is about 40 years old, while his companion has just turned 20. Despite his youth and inexperience, or more likely because of it, Alcibiades is full of self-confidence. He tells Socrates that he doesn't need anyone or anything. He can rely on his own strengths, from his undisputed physical beauty to his penchant for daring, from his noble ancestry to his considerable wealth. The young man is preparing to appear a few days later in front of the Athenian people. He's looking forward to the occasion, which he fully believes will result in honors being showered on him, the likes of which have never been granted before, not even to his adoptive father, the statesman Pericles, who will die the following year, struck by the plague that has already put Athens at a great disadvantage in its war against Sparta. A war, incidentally, that has been orchestrated in part by Pericles himself. Socrates throws cold water on Alcibiades' expectations. He warns Alcibiades that he will not accomplish the things he wants to accomplish without Socrates' help. That's bold talk. 
But Socrates backs it up with an observation to which his young companion readily assents. Sound advice about politics and statesmanship comes from those who actually know and have thought about such things, not from wealth, which is Alcibiades' main asset. I hardly have to point out the relevance of this remark to us denizens of the 21st century, two and a half millennia after Socrates spoke. The philosopher underscores his point in his usual way, by analogy. Suppose you wish to give advice on food, explaining to people that a particular foodstuff is better than another one and that it should be consumed in this quantity. Then someone stops you and says, wait a minute, what do you mean better? And your response is, I mean more healthy, of course. But it turns out that you are not in fact a doctor and you know nothing about health. Surely that will be disgraceful, though that hasn't stopped ancient and modern charlatans alike. The ongoing conversation isn't about food and health. It's about the just way to conduct the business of the state. Socrates accordingly asks Alcibiades how he managed as a mere child to distinguish between what is just and what is unjust. The young man immediately acknowledges that, well, as it turns out, he didn't really discover the difference between justice and injustice all by himself. Instead, he learned it, just like everyone else. But Socrates is far from satisfied. Be more specific, my friend. Learn from whom? From the many, comes the response. Although Socrates does not have the tools of contemporary logic at his disposal and can't name Alcibiades' logical fallacy as we would today, he knows it when he sees it. Learning from the multitude is no guarantee of learning anything of value. Just as you would want a doctor, not the people at large, to diagnose your illness and prescribe your medicine, you shouldn't attempt to govern a nation on the basis of popular opinion. Now, they keep going on a little bit uh, and, uh, and talk about, you know, Socrates is, is probing Alcibiades about what he wants to do and what he doesn't want to do. And at some point, let me find it. Socrates is, to his, to his own satisfaction, he has demonstrated to Alcibiades that he doesn't know what he's talking about. And so Socrates says, then alas, Alcibiades, what a condition you suffer from. I hesitate to name it, but since we too are alone, it must be said. You are wedded to stupidity, best of men, of the most extreme sort, as the argument accuses you and you accuse yourself. So this is why you're leaping into the affairs of the city before you have been educated. You're not the only one to suffer from this. Most of those who manage the affairs of the city are the same way. So this is the time where Alcibiades put, get put in this place, essentially. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Massimo. Um, OK, I have one more question before we head into the audience questions. Right. Have you sent a copy of your book to Georgia Maloney yet? And how do we get this into <laughs> Italian as soon as possible? Well, yeah, no, I haven't sent it yet. The question is, in fact, the, the, the issue is, no, there is no way that Georgia Maloney would be receptive to this kind of, for, for those of you who might not know, Georgia Maloney is the newly elected uh, prime minister of Italy, and she's a direct descendant of, intellectually speaking, a Mussolini. So this, she's a neo-fascist. Uh, Meloni is exactly the kind of person that would be completely unresponsive to either this book or even to Socrates himself, right? So that's what I was saying earlier, that this book, I think, has two audiences other than anybody who wants to improve their character. I mean, this is not just about po politics and politicians. This is also, you know, there's an entire, uh, there's a chapter in there near the end where I present an actual curriculum or how to improve your, your own character. So this is also for anybody who wants to become a better person. But if we're talking about politicians, then this is, needs to be in the hands of two kinds of people, as we were saying earlier. One, those more or less rare politicians or people who are thinking about getting into politics who want to do the right thing. And there are such things, such people. It's not like there is nobody out there. And, um, and the other category is teachers and parents. It's the next generation that needs to pay attention to these things. It's the next generation that we count on. Uh, it's, too right, it's already too, fix, too late to fix people like Maloney. She's, she's beyond hope already, yeah. unfortunately. Okay, well, let's just hope people in Italy um, read this book and encourage, well, all, <laughs> not just Italy, of course, everywhere. Sure. Um, yeah, uh, fabulous. So, okay, 
question from the chat. What might be a working definition of potential and how might one manifest virtuous potential? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, there is this research in, again, modern social psychology and developmental, developmental psychology where you can uh, quantify uh, aspects of character, right? So things like generosity, for instance, uh, you know, how generous a, a kid is or how on the opposite, at the opposite end of the spectrum, how stingy or how self-centered the person is. I mean, we already do this to some extent in order to identify uh, extreme examples right, of behavior that need attention. So in other words, we do pay attention to the pathological aspect of character. If a kid is a little bit too, uh, de you know, going in the direction of sociopathy, basically, or, 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 or really problematic behavior, what do we do? We call the counselor, we call the psychologist, we call somebody who actually can uh, attempt to deal with the situation. What we don't do, which is really weird in my mind, is to pay attention to all the rest of the kids. That is, right? I mean, it's like, so we recognize the pathology and we try to act on it. Why don't we also do uh, pay attention to the rest of the kids who are on a, on a spectrum in terms of character from potentially very good to potentially not so good and help everyone? It's, that would be like... Um, like focusing, let's say that you were uh, wanting to teach a, a musical instrument to everybody, and you're focusing only on the people that are not, are not learning. They really have, they're tone deaf. They're, they're just not, they're not responding. Any, and, and you're neglecting the rest of the class for some strange reason. That's what we're doing in terms of teaching, you know, in terms of character, in terms of, of uh, improving kids from that perspective, which is really weird. It's just not well thought out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And further to that, we have a question. Um, I was pleased with what you said about education. As you know, I speak like the ancient mariner about the Michaela School here in London. Right. I see that in the USA, Ian Rowe has written a book, Agency, which must be a appealing the Stoics. He speaks about the four virtues. My question is why are Stoics lethargic or invisible in supporting schools which embody character building? Yeah, that, that is a great question. It's, um, but for one thing, there are not a lot of Stoics around. Uh, I mean, even, even though Stoicism is in fact very popular, surprisingly popular, I guess, over has become surprisingly popular over the last 10 years. It's not like Stoics represent a significant fraction of the population, right? It's not like we are, there are as many Stoics as, let's say, Buddhists out there or something like that. Um, so that's one part of the answer. It's like even, even if Stoics were going out there, you know, trying to, to make things better from that perspective, the impact would be minimal. But there is an additional problem with, I think, the Stoic community as it has developed over the last decade or so. And that is that there is a significant fraction of this community, not certainly not everyone, but there's a significant fraction of this community that has, is interpreting Stoicism as rather self-centered. That is, these, these are the people who are focused on uh, life hacks, right? Or how do I improve my life? How do I, Im I and sometimes even in directions that the Stoics would be, the ancient Stoics would be really puzzled by, like, oh, uh, use Epictetus or Marcus Aurelius to, to become famous or to become rich or, or to make it in the business or something like that. It's like, that would be really weird because Epictetus will look at you and, and slap you in the face and say, you, if, if that's what you want to do, you understand nothing about Stoicism. Stoicism is not about becoming rich and famous and powerful and all that sort of stuff. It's about improving yourself as a member of the human cosmopolis, as a, as a member of society at large. So I think that there are two issues there. On the one hand, even though Stoicism certainly could help in fact the movie that i mentioned um, earlier which is entitled young plato the one about the kids in uh, in uh, in belfast although the teacher there the principal teaches all sorts of philosophers you can see there are scenes on, on where there are a bunch of philosophers on the wall including modern ones but in fact more often than not he goes back to the stoics there's a really nice scene where he's explaining seneca on anger to the kids because of course 
kids have an anger problem often. And, you know, they, they have fights in the schoolyard, they, there's bullying and all that sort of stuff. And that has to do with anger. And so, yes, the sto you would think that stoicism is particularly, not uniquely perhaps, but particularly well suited to be helpful in these in these arena. But there are two problems. Number one, there's not that many stoics. And number two, even among the modern stoics, there is there's too many of them uh, that uh, think of stoicism as as self-centered, as a life hack, and not as a, a way to be helpful to the cosmopolis. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, is it possible for a politician to maintain their character in today's political environment in the United States, especially when you consider that we only have two political parties? <laughs> yeah, the two political parties bit is is problematic and and it's very specific to the United States. It's history. It's the result of of historical constraints, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I, I agree that it's problematic. But the general question, the question is actually general, right? So can a politician maintain character or integrity uh, given the nature of politics? And this is not just in the United States. It's, I think it's worldwide. And in fact, I think it's across time. Uh, one of the reasons I'm so interested in the Greco-Romans is, is because they understood something basic about human nature and human psychology that still applies today and if you read what was happening in ancient republican rome in terms of politics in terms of how people interacted with each other you will find very very recognizable stories uh, that you could easily just transplant into the 21st century and it will work in the same way now so the answer to the question i think the best answer to the question that i can come up with is you do it like cicero did so one of the characters that I talk about in the book is Cicero. In the, in, book, in the book, there are two or three chapters where I go through examples of statesmen that have been that have been taught uh, by philosophers, like for instance Aristotle teaching Alexander, or Seneca teaching Nero, or Plato teaching Dionysus II of Syracuse. And then there are examples of statesmen who wanted to be philosophers, meaning that they wanted to learn on their own uh, and, and practice philosophy on their own. For instance, Marcus Aurelius, uh, Cato the Younger in Roman Republic, and Cicero. And the trend is pretty clear. It's far better if the statesman wants to learn philosophy and practice philosophy rather than if somebody else comes in and tries to teach him philosophy. Uh, almost all the cases of philosophers trying to teach statesmen end up badly. The, the obvious example being Seneca and Nero, um, but even you know the, the story of Plato and Dionysus II is well is less known. But Plato had guts. I mean, at the age of sixty, he he crossed the Mediterranean uh, to go to Syracuse because he had a chance of putting into practice his political ideas, and he almost lost his life twice <laughs> as as a result. So those things really don't go very well. What works better is when the the politician, the statement is already a philosopher, meaning that he is a person or he or she is a person who already practices philosophy as a way of living. Now, the best example, however, there is Cicero, because if we're talking about integrity, Cicero was not just a philosopher, he was a politician, he was an advocate, he was a lawyer. And he knew that the nature of politics is compromise. In fact, he's often accused, even by modern commentators, of being a flip-flopper, right? Of, of, of shifting allegiances. Uh, oh, and one time he, he goes with this guy, and the other time he goes with these other guys. Like, what, what's, what's up with that? But what Cicero was doing was to shift his immediate priorities, modus operandi, with the events, with the unfolding of the events, as any good politician should do. Um, you know, but he had the same general goal in mind. He wanted to save the Republic. That's what was important to him. And then the rest was a matter of, well, today it looks like the best way to save the Republic is to go this way. Tomorrow it might be different and you need to be flexible. So when we're talking about maintaining integrity, it depends on what we're talking about. Sometimes people seem to think that maintaining integrity is a matter of never changing your mind or of never, uh, uh, you know, shifting 
uh, priorities or allegiances or, or something like that. That's not maintaining your integrity. This, that's be, be, being stubborn to the end and probably not getting the results that you want. In fact, there was a character like that in ancient Rome. That was Cato the Younger, who was a contemporary of Cicero. He was a friend of Cicero and he was a Stoic. But Cato, in fact, Cato was so well known for, for being a, uh, you know, a somebody with high integrity that if a Roman, a regular Roman uh, were to do some, were caught doing something not quite kosher, his response likely would have been, well, not everybody can be a Cato. So Cato was such a, you know, role model, basically. But the problem is he was also very rigid. He was also so into principles for principles sake that he arguably seriously contributed to the, to the end of the Republic. And there is a, at one point, Cicero was so frustrated with him that he writes a letter to his lifelong friend Atticus. And he says, you know, about Cato, nobody loves, loves him more than I do. But the guy thinks that he's living in, in Plato's Republic, not in the mud of Romulus. Right? And that give, to me, that's a really nice summary of how you do maintain, what it means to maintain integrity for a politician. It doesn't mean thinking that you live in Plato's Republic, so you're going to have the best possible situation under that best possible circumstances. Is maintaining integrity, maintaining your goals, even though you realize that you live in the mud of Romulus, that you live in a situation that is really chaotic and complicated and it shifts all the time. I, I'm feeling the mud of Romulus every day, at the moment, but I think we all are. Um, so in your book, you have a whole like comprehensive syllabus or course of self-study um, for developing virtuous character. So, you know, the first step in the quest for character would be to get the book. Um, but while we're waiting for bookstores to open tomorrow, you know, what's what are some things or what's one thing that we could take away and do right now to after we finish here to, to start cultivating virtue well there are there's a number of things that do work and a number of things that don't work and and again there is data from this is not just the greco romans there is this is data from modern cognitive science that tells us this for instance one thing that does work is uh what the uh, psychologist christian miller uh calls getting out getting the word out with ourselves meaning uh keeping a diary uh, where you keep track of your failures as well as your successes when it comes to character improvement. Now, why would that be helpful? So the, the, the classic example of that is Marcus Aurelius's Meditations, right? The entire book is his philosophical journal where he writes to himself and he says, oh, today that, was, that wasn't that good. Why? And let's analyze it. And, or this one actually went pretty well. This time you behave correctly. And you know, what, what happened in that case? So one thing that really does work is start after this thing is over, go home. And before you go to bed, start a philosophical journal. A philosophical journal, there are, there are a couple of hints on how to do it, a couple of good uh, ways to do it. You want to write regularly, not necessarily every night, but regularly. You don't need to spend a lot of time. Just a few minutes a day is enough. You want to probably do it in a structured way. For instance, you could for every day ask yourself about a particular action, a particular day, you know, what did I do wrong? What did I do right? And what could I do better next time around? The reason for that is because you want to learn from your mistakes. You want to also learn from your successes. And you want to ask yourself the question, you know, the next time that something like this, that a situation similar to this occurs, how do I prepare myself mentally to actually dealing with it better? And then the other suggestion, again, about philosophical journaling is write in the second person, just like Marcus Aurelius does. Uh, the meditations is written in the second person as if he were writing a letter to a friend. And there is good evidence from modern science that shows that that is a very good way to do it because it helps putting some uh, emotional distance between you and your, and your own attempt to become better. It's when you write in the second person, it's easier to stay away from emotional language and to focus on an analytical approach to the problem. So today I got upset, you got upset with your coworker. Oh, this is what happened, et cetera, et cetera. As if you were giving advice to a friend. 
it's easier for yourself to take advice from you if you if you're writing to yourself in the in that in that fashion if you write in the first person you tend to use emotional language and then you tend to relive the situations rather than learn from the situation and that's a very very different uh, thing so if there is one thing to do that everybody can do and you know tonight open your you know a diary an actual diary physical thing where you write down or your laptop or your tablet, whatever it is that you use, and start a philosophical diary. Fabulous. Thank you, Massimo. And thank you for this wonderful discussion. And thank you, everybody, for your insightful questions. Um, I hope our leaders read this book and pay attention as well. But um, where, what's your, um, could you put your um, blog in the in the chat or how can people stay in touch and get sure the um the the easy way to follow everything pretty much that i do is to go to massimo org. i'm putting it in the chat also that's uh, the sort of comprehensive site where uh, there are links to all my books all the podcasts videos whatever <laughs> Any, anything Thank you is. might be interested in reading that i've done it, it's there <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much, Massimo. And thank you, everybody. And congratulations. Thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate it. And thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, yeah. Have a good night and uh, stay safe. <laughs>